in this lecture, we're going to build upon lecture one and derive what are called the Redfield equations or the Bloch Wagner's Redfield equations, or as I'll frequently say, the BWR equations. We have two goals. One is to explain T1 relaxation. As you recall from the first lecture, we left with the Solomon equations, which told us that cross relaxation could occur, but we didn't have a microscopic link to molecular properties then for longitudinal relaxation. And the second question we were left with is whether cross relaxation can happen with other types of coherences other than longitudinal magnetization. And we need the Redfield equations to answer that question. Now, as you'll see, one downside to the Redfield equations is the mathematics get somewhat complicated. But we're going to try to make use of the way we solved the random phase model to simplify our approach to the Redfield equations. Because we've set the problem up so that every step, or virtually every step, in the derivation in this lecture will parallel the derivation that we already did for the random phase model. So I'll skip over a lot of detail because we already know how that derivation worked. So our difficulty is that when it comes to longitudinal relaxation, you'll recall that we have to take into account the transverse fluctuations as well as longitudinal fluctuations. So we have to keep track of fluctuations in the x direction, the y direction, and the z direction. So we could, in principle, write down a differential equation that includes fluctuations in the local fields in all three directions. And we could continue now to solve this differential equation in the same way that we solved the problem for adiabatic relaxation of transverse magnetization. The difference would be, at every step along the way, we have to be careful that we're doing matrix algebra rather than algebra with numbers. So we have to remember that matrices don't necessarily commute upon multiplication, and we'd have to keep track of this quite carefully. This is perfectly fine. The only difficulty, then, would be that the matrices can get quite large as we include more different types of local magnetic fields. And we just don't like dealing with matrices very much. So what we're going to do is replace the matrices with symbolic operators and work out an operator algebra to solve the problem because our brains are better suited to thinking about symbols than about matrices. At the same time, if we did do the calculation all in matrices, it's then difficult to look at the results and learn interesting simplifications or interesting facts about relaxation. So another side advantage of switching to an operator description is that we'll be able to discern some insight into important features of relaxation. So what we're going to do is use operator representations of the spins and the Hamiltonians. But of course, operators all have matrix representations. So if we get stuck and don't know what to do at any step in the derivation, we can always revert to matrices and work out the steps along the way in matrix algebra. We also will make use of the fact that we care about rotation in NMR. We care about rotation in spin space. And in solution, we care about rotations in physical space of molecules. So it'll be very useful to express the fluctuating Hamiltonians in terms of their rotational processes, or their rotational properties. And while that will lead to some complexity in the symbolic notation, 
it in fact leads to great simplification in the overall theory. Again, the operators or super operators don't necessarily commute. We have to pay attention to commutation just as with their matrix representations. Any operation that we're unsure about, we can always expand in Taylor series, work out term by term each term in the Taylor series, and then sum the result to figure out what that operation means. Most of the time, I'm just going to tell you what the operations are so that we don't actually have to do that ourselves. But generations of graduate students have worked all this out. At the same time, because the operators have matrix representations, we can always work in a basis of operators that makes the problem as simple as possible. The answers that we get can't depend on the, on the basis, so we might as well pick a convenient basis rather than an inconvenient basis. Now, just for one example of the sorts of things we might find out if we did Taylor series expansion, here we just have A as some operator such that when it operates on a cat psi, we get back a number lambda times the cat psi. So this, as you know, is an eigenvalue equation. So then I could ask, what is the exponential of this operator times an angle phi? So if A was just a number, you know what the exponential is. But now we're asking about the exponential of an operator. So to find out, I expand in Taylor series. So I'm just showing the first terms of the Taylor series expansion. And then I distribute the cat in. So each term now is operating on the cat. And I interpret a term like AA acting on the cat. First, I operate on the cat with the first A. I take that answer and operate with the second operator A. And if I have three operators, I do that three times. So that leads to this. So for example, A acts on the cat to give back lambda times the cat. A operates again, and I get lambda squared times the ket. And then I can factor the ket back out. And now I have a numerical series. And I recognize that that series is just the exponential theta times lambda acting again on the ket. So here I've worked out the result of the exponential operator acting on one of its eigenkets. So as we go forward, if I need to, I can always do this type of expansion to figure out what I mean by some function of operators that I don't know a priori. So in our random phase model, we started out saying that the fluctuating longitudinal field consisted of omega naught, the Larmor frequency, plus delta omega of t, the fluctuating field along z. And we wrote down a precession equation. In the red field or BWR theory, we switch to the density operator. So we have the time dependence of the density operator. And now we have the commutator of H0, which contains the Zeeman field and any of the isotropic components of the Hamiltonian, the chemical shift, the J couplings, and then the fluctuating Hamiltonian, which I call H1 of t here. Now, I want to make these two equations look the same. And I do that by switching to a superoperator representation. And I'll normally express the superoperators with a hat. And I've defined two here, L0 hat and L1 hat. And with those definitions, you can see that the random phase model equation looks exactly like my red field theory equation. They're isomorphous. It's just that one has operators in it, and the other has just numbers in it. And trivially, a minus sign. Um, that's unimportant. And what are these Ls? Ls are the commutators. These are the commutation super operators. So I hide the commutators by calling them L. 
that makes the two equations look isomorphous. I just have to remember at various steps along the way that I have commutation super operators. I don't have numbers. But this is a terrific simplification because since the equations are isomorphous, I can solve them in exactly the same way. I already know the steps to solving the random phase equation. I can apply those same steps to solve now the red field equations. So what did we do? Our first step in the random phase model was to transform to the rotating frame so that omega naught was hidden away. And now we're going to do the same thing. We want to transform and make the super operator L0 disappear. That transformation is called the interaction frame transformation. But you can see formally it looks the same. In the rotating frame, we multiplied by a co complex exponential. And now I multiply by a complex exponential. It just happens to be the exponential of a super operator. I don't necessarily know what the exponential of a super operator is. But again, I can work this out by Taylor series and eventually find out that this transformation is equivalent to multiplying by the exponential of h naught operating on the density operator and then operating on the other side by minus the exponential of h naught. So we have this kind of sandwich surrounding sigma. It's not obvious that this would be the case. I had to work this out or somebody had to work this out by doing the Taylor series expansions originally. But that's the result. And I can make use of that then. Um, again, here's just the beginning of the Taylor series expansion, just to show that if I keep just the first couple of terms, the first couple of terms anyway agree with my statement. That's not really a proof. That just tells you it's not irrational to have that result. But now I'm going to do the same thing. I want to transform the density operator into the new frame of reference. And I need a differential equation. So just as in the first lecture, I differentiate both sides using the chain rule. I have to be careful not to commute terms that don't commute with each other. And I substitute in for d sigma dt my original equation, do some algebra, And now I play a game, a game that I'll play over and over again, which is whenever I need to, I can introduce the identity operator into any expression. The identity operator acts on any operator and just returns that operator. It has no effect. And the identity operator can be e to the minus exponential times e to the plus exponential of some term. So here on the last line, I've inserted into the middle of the expression the exponent of minus i h naught t times the exponential of plus i h naught t. That's unity. But by doing that, you can see that I have these kind of sandwiches now surrounding L1 and surrounding sigma. So that this then is a transformation both of sigma to the new reference frame and the transformation of L1 to the new reference frame. This is slightly different from our first derivation because our first derivation switched into a rotating frame, but we only had z fluctuations. And fluctuations along z don't care about whether we're in a rotating frame or not. Right? Z, the z-axis is the same in the laboratory frame and in the rotating frame. So previously, our fluctuations were unaffected by the transformation. Here, because we have transverse fluctuations, those transverse fluctuations are also affected in the new reference frame. And this takes that into account so that we end up with the differential of the transform density operator 
Now the super operator L0 has disappeared and we have transformed into the new frame both the fluctuating term, the L1, and the density operator. But that's the only difference so far that we had to take into account the transformation of both the fluctuating Hamiltonian and the transformation of the density operator. But now we have an equation in which the H naught or L naught has disappeared and we can proceed now with the exact steps we used before. So here's what were our equation in the random phase model. Here's our transformed equation in the new theory. We're going to integrate this differential equation just like we did before. We're going to take the ensemble average just like before. We're going to expand in Taylor series just like before. We're going to interchange the averaging and integration just like before. The first order term is going to be zero by construction just like before. So I can skip all those steps. Then we'll differentiate and we come to this step. So the upper line is our result for the random phase model and our lower line is the result in the derivation of the Redfield equations. And these again look identical to each other. They're isomorphous to each other. So we'll continue in the same way. So in the random phase model, I replaced m plus of 0 by m plus of t. And in the Redfield derivation, I replace sigma of 0 by sigma of t minus the equilibrium density operator. Now this is a difference as well. In the random phase model, at long times, the magnetization decays to 0. But the density operator at long times has to decay to Boltzmann equilibrium, not to 0. If I just replace sigma of 0 by sigma of t, then we would predict that the density operator decays away to 0, and we know that's wrong. So here I just patch the system. I just, again, use a kludge to get the answer that I know is right. I know that the density operator should go to the Boltzmann equilibrium, and by substituting sigma t minus sigma 0, I ensure that that will happen. Now, I can verify that this was the right thing to do, of course, by making measurements when I'm all done. When the theory is complete, I can make predictions, go to the NMR spectrometer, make measurements, and show that I made the right choice. Or I can go back and do a more complicated theory. The reason we get the wrong answer and have to fix it in this ad hoc manner is that we've ignored the lattice. All I've said about the lattice is that it has infinite heat capacity and can transfer energy back and forth to the spin system as necessary. In reality, the lattice has energy eigenstates, etc. So in a full treatment, I would have to consider both the lattice and the spin system from a quantum mechanical point of view. If we did that, we would then find that evolution to the Boltzmann equilibrium comes naturally into the theory. That's much more complicated. It's more complicated than I can do um, in this lecture or possibly ever. So I will just assure you that other people have done that derivation and that shows that this is the right fix. I'm also now not going to keep writing the angle brackets, otherwise the notation gets just too complicated. So I've taken the angle brackets away from the sigmas, and I'll just leave the angle brackets around the fluctuating Hamiltonians. But from now on, sigma means the ensemble average over the sample, not over a subensemble. And then just as before, we'll extend the upper bound of the integral to infinity. So we have, again, a coarse-grained 
the time scale. We can't ask about times comparable to the correlation time, just as in our random phase model. And the final line then is our equation then for evolution of the density operator in the interaction frame, in the transform frame. And if I plug back in what I mean by the L's in terms of commutators, I now have this average over the double commutators of the fluctuating Hamiltonian. And that's the form you'll see this equation written most often in which the commutators are actually shown explicitly rather than being hidden inside the symbols L. Now what did we do at this point in the random phase derivation? At this point we transform back to the laboratory frame of reference in order to get an equation in the laboratory frame. So we want to do the same thing here. We want to transform back to the laboratory frame. So I do the same thing. I have my equation for the transform density operator and I can differentiate it and then solve for the laboratory frame density operator, substitute in what I know for the derivative of the transform density operator, the equation I just derived. And the key part here is the second term. I have the complex exponential of L0 acting on my autocorrelation function for the fluctuating Louisvillians. And I have to work out what that means. And this is a little more complicated than transforming from the rotating frame. So here's the key part that I need to understand. And I've written now the complex exponential of L0 times T in terms of the Hamiltonians, and remember that is this kind of sandwich with the exponentials on the outside and whatever I'm transforming on the inside. And now I'll play the game of inserting the unity operator whenever I need to so that I end up with these sandwiches surrounding each term, these pairs of complex exponentials surrounding each of the L1s and surrounding sigma. so that I can transform sigma back to the lab frame now, and I can transform L1 of t back to the lab frame. But now I have t prime and t left over, so I have to figure out what to do about the t prime and t variables. So once again, I'll define t prime to be t minus tau, just like I did before, and substitute that in, and you can see then that I have the complex exponential of H naught now times T prime plus T. So I can do one transform. So now I'm kind of stuck. I have L1 of T prime back in the lab frame but I still have these H naught transformations as a function of tau. So when I plug back in and substitute this back in, this is my answer back in the lab frame. I've recovered the evolution under L naught but inside my ensemble average, I still have this funny behavior that I have to transform L1 at t minus tau by H naught at time tau. So again, this is different from our initial derivation and we're a little bit stuck, or I'm a little bit stuck. And it's not obvious how we should proceed. So being stuck, I'm going to go backwards and see if I can find another way around the problem. I'm going to go back into the interaction frame 
and now write things in terms of the Hamiltonians. And now I want to try to make use of symmetry properties of the Hamiltonians to try to work my way around this problem where I was stuck and wasn't sure what to do about the last transformation. This will end up solving two problems at once. One problem we know about, the other problem we don't really know that we have yet, but we'll see that we have another problem. And we'll end up solving them both at the same time. Now, the trick is to write the stochastic Hamiltonian as the sum over some basis operators. And it's a bit unfortunate that the typography gets complicated. So the bold-faced A's are a set of basis operators. These are spin operators. They're combinations of IZ, I plus, I minus, S plus, S minus, SZ, et cetera. We'll see their explicit forms eventually. The K's are the rank of those operators. These will be spherical tensor operators at the end of the day of rank K. In NMR, the ranks that are important, at least in solution, are K equals 1 and K equals to 2. Q will run from minus K to plus K. So if k is equal to 1, q can run minus 1, 0, plus 1. If k is equal to 2, q can run from minus 2, minus 1, 0, plus 1, plus 2. The variables f contain all the stochastic information. This will contain all the physical constants as well as the dependence on orientational angles. And then the minus 1 to the q is just a numerical factor. Different texts or authors might bury the minus 1 to the q inside of the f's. This is an unfortunate part of the theory that these minus 1's are just kind of an annoyance. So we've expanded the Hamiltonian operator in terms of some basis operators just as we could expand the density operator in terms of basis operators. The second summation here includes an index P. And this is simply to keep track of the fact that Q will act a bit like a coherence order. So that when Q is 1, we'll be thinking about operators that in some sense have associated with them a q equals 1 frequency. And you'll see more of this in a moment. But we're going to have to keep track of the fact that, for example, the single quantum frequency of an I spin and an S spin could be different from each other. If the I spin is a hydrogen, the single quantum frequency would be 500 megahertz on a 500 megahertz spectrometer. And if the S spin is a carbon, its frequency is 125 megahertz. And we'll need to keep track of these separately. So this index P is introduced. I'll give P integer numbers like 0 and 1, but the numbers themselves don't mean anything. It's just to distinguish different frequencies. I could have called them green and purple and red. Um, it just so happens I'll give them integer numbers. And again, these Fs are stochastic variables. We also have to keep track of what we mean by minus indices and positive indices, and this will have to do with either taking complex conjugates or, or adjoints. And again, we just need to keep careful track of these sort of terms. I already said that the A's are a spherical tensor operator. And again, we'll define them in such a way that their minus Q is related to the adjoint. And the adjoint, remember, is the transpose complex conjugate of the matrix representation of the operator. So how do we pick? The critical thing is not all these labels. The critical thing is how do we pick the operators? And we pick the basis operators 
such that the commutator with H naught returns the operator times a frequency. So the basis operators A are eigenoperators of the Louisville super operator, the commutation super operator. So L naught hat acting on an operator A gives back that operator A with some associated frequency omega. Omega is called the eigenvalue of the commutation super operator, and the A's then are the eigenoperators of the commutation super operator. Why do we pick those particular operators? We pick those operators because we can then show that when we transform these operators into the interaction frame, we get the operator back times the exponential of that frequency, of the eigenfrequency times time. So again, knowing the answer in advance, I knew that I wanted to pick the operators such that they transformed easily into the interaction frame. I wanted it as simple, as clean as possible, a transformation into the interaction frame, and this is as simple as it could be. The operators in the interaction frame simply pick up a phase factor, a complex phase factor. e to the i omega times t is just a phase factor. So again, here is our examples from the chemical shift anisotropy Hamiltonian that we've seen before. And when I do the decomposition, we have the second order spherical tensor operators A to P, Q. As it turns out in this case, we don't need P index. It can be gotten rid of. Q goes from minus 1, 0, plus 1. It so happens that the terms 2 and minus 2 don't exist in this Hamiltonian. The tensor operators are I minus, IZ, and I plus with some normalization factors. The normalization factors, again, are a numerical complication, but they're important so that at the end of the day we get relaxation rate constants that have the right scale. And each of these operators has associated with it a frequency. And IZ, for example, has a frequency of zero. When we transform into a frame that's rotating, IZ is unchanged. I minus has a frequency associated with it of minus omega I, and I plus has a frequency omega I associated with it. The stochastic functions F are shown, and in general, we can always write these as some variables that I lump together and called C here, in this case, these are the numerical factors that give the size of the chemical shift anisotropy, and our old friends, the spherical harmonics. And now the spherical harmonics are written out explicitly for Q equals 0, plus 1, and minus 1. So any Hamiltonian that we can think of, we can write down this kind of decomposition where we have the basis operators A and then the associated functions f that will be composed of various parameters plus the spherical harmonics. So we have then this result that when we transform one of the basis operators into the interaction frame, we get back that operator times the phase factor and we can use that then to express the Hamiltonian in the interaction frame, then becomes the sum over the F's and the A's with these complex phase factors. So our interaction frame transformation becomes particularly simple, and that, as I said, was our goal. We picked the operators so that this transformation would be simple. And when I substitute back in to my equation, 
I end up with a result that has a large number of sums. Remember, each Hamiltonian was a sum over Q and sum over P. I have the Hamiltonian appearing twice, so I have four summations. Now I factored out from the averaging the spin operators because they don't depend on the different stochastic trajectories. I only need to average over the stochastic variables. And now I've switched from angle brackets to over bars. And I'd like to simplify this equation. Now the first simplification is that Q prime has to be equal to minus Q. This is a property simply of the spherical harmonic functions that the correlation function of the spherical harmonics will be zero unless that's the case. I'm not going to prove that, I'm just stating it. And that collapses one of the sums. I had a sum of Q prime and Q, each of them going from minus K to plus K. Now I require Q prime to be equal to minus Q, so one summation disappears. It's really a fact that the spherical harmonics that have this variable phi that has a muthal angle that really drives this result. Now, I also have in the equation this complex phase factor that came from the interaction frame transformation. Remember, e to the i theta is just cosine theta plus i sine theta. So these complex exponentials are just sinusoids, and sinusoids average over the range plus 1 to minus 1 and average to 0 over a cycle. So if this frequency is large, if this complex frequency is large on the time scale I care about, then these oscillatory factors are going to drive the derivative to zero and I won't have any effect. So I will only have terms surviving in the sum when these two frequencies are identical because then I have e to the zero times t and the exponential of zero is one. So these complex phase factors vanish cause that term in the sum to vanish unless these two frequencies are equal to each other. And that requires that P prime and P be equal to each other. And this is called the secular hypothesis. Terms that satisfy this condition are called secular and other terms are called non-secular. So when we make this assumption, we can throw away from the summations all the non-secular terms and just keep the secular terms. So we require then that P is equal to P prime. We collapse that sum, those exponentials disappear. And now it turns out I can easily transform back into the laboratory frame and get my final result. In the laboratory frame now, we have precession under H naught or evolution under H naught. And now we have two sums over Q and over P. We have a double commutator with respect to the basis operators. And now we also have an integral that is the autocorrelation function of the spatial functions times the exponential of minus I omega tau. And you'll recognize that as the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function. That's the definition of a Fourier transform. In our random phase model, we had the integral of the autocorrelation function. That would be the case if omega was zero. Omega zero, remember, was associated with the z terms in the Hamiltonian. Those are the longitudinal terms. So, our random phase model is equivalent to this model when we only consider 
terms where omega pq are equal to 0, the adiabatic terms. But now we see we have other possibilities. In the general equation, we have other possibilities because we have frequencies associated with, for example, I minus, and frequencies associated with the I plus terms, and those would be non-zero frequencies here. So we see an expansion of our theory in which our relaxation rates depended on the integral of the autocorrelation function, but now more generally we have the result that we depend on the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function. Now the Fourier transform is a complex valued function. We'll call the power spectral density function to be the real part of that Fourier transform. And for relaxation, that's what we're going to focus on. There is an imaginary part, of course. The imaginary part can be lumped in with H0. Again, I'm not going to explain how that happens. That's called the dynamic frequency shift but it can be added in with H0 and is just part of the normal evolution. One can try to measure that. There are papers measuring the dynamic frequency shift, but we're going to primarily focus on relaxation, so we need the real part of the Fourier transform. And then in isotropic solution, there's another simplification, and that is the Fourier transform for different values of Q are related to the Fourier transform when Q is equal to zero simply by another factor of minus one to the Q power. So these minus ones raised to various powers keep emerging, but this is a nice simplification because we only have to calculate one of these spectral density functions. We don't have to calculate a separate one for every value of Q. And there it is, so I'll call little j. I'll drop the superscript zero, and little j of omega then is the real part of the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function of the stochastic functions with Q equal to zero and rank K. So then we can devise more symbols to make this look simpler. Gamma is called the relaxation superoperator, and then its form is shown here. It's the sum over Q, sum over P of the J's, the double commutators with respect to the basis operators. This factor of a half occurs because one normally extends the integral to minus infinity for convenience, or at least I normally extend the integral to minus infinity for convenience. Other authors don't, so one again has to pay attention to whether you need the factor of one half or not. As I said, there's the dynamic frequency shift that comes from the imaginary part of the Fourier transform but that can be incorporated into H0 and we won't worry about it any further. So we have an equation in terms of the density operator, but we frequently like to analyze NMR experiments in terms of the product operators or some basis operators rather than thinking about the density operator itself. So we can do the same thing here. We can write the density operator as an expansion in a set of basis operators and make this substitution into our equation. And then play the usual game of pre-multiplying by one of the other basis operators forming the trace, and then using the fact that the basis operators are orthonormal. So 
I pre-multiply by an operator B sub M, take the adjoint trace, make use of the orthogonality of the basis operators, and I end up with a set of coupled differential equations for the coefficients, the expansion coefficients, in which omega m sub m is an evolution frequency, and r sub m n is a relaxation rate constant between the two operators. If m and n are identical, that's the auto relaxation rate constant, and if m and n are different from each other, that's a cross relaxation rate constant between the two operators. You'll notice that I've divided by the trace of B sub M with itself. If the operator basis was normalized to unity, that would be one and I wouldn't have to write it. But the operator basis might not be normalized to unity and in that case that division fixes the problem. You might wonder how did I know whether to divide by B sub M magnitude or to divide by the magnitude of B sub N, but it's important, and this illustrates the importance, that whatever the norm of the basis is, it has to be the same for all the operators. So the trace of B sub M with itself doesn't necessarily have to be unity, but it has to be equal to the trace of B sub N with itself. So I don't need to normalize to unity, but I need to normalize each of the basis operators to the same value. Otherwise, I get into trouble. Now, this is a complicated equation. What does it tell us that we didn't know before? Well, first of all, we can look at this equation and see that we have two factors that determine whether we're going to have efficient relaxation. First, we have the trace over the double commutator shown there. So we have the trace with respect to the operator B sub M and the double commutator with respect to the operator B sub N. If that happens to be zero, those terms in the fluctuating Hamiltonian have no effect on relaxation. So this is a kind of selection rule for relaxation. Any time that trace vanishes, those particular parts of the fluctuating Hamiltonian don't affect the relaxation of the operator across relaxation between the operators M and N. So in the first lecture, we pointed out that one trick we try to play to work on large molecules is to find coherences that relax slowly. So here's one way. If we can find coherences M and N such that this trace vanishes, then those operators, the magnetization or coherences associated with those operators won't relax by those terms in the Hamiltonian. We'll have a trozy effect. So that's one important part, qualitative part, that comes out of this equation. Relaxation is only effective when this double commutator trace operation is non-zero. Or we have a trozy-like effect if it is zero. The other important result is that the power spectral density function has to be large. If the power spectral density function is small, at whatever frequencies show up in the equation, then we won't have effective relaxation. The power spectral density is characterizing the amplitude of fluctuations occurring at a particular frequency. So if at a particular frequency, 
the amplitudes are small, then relaxation will also be inefficient. What frequencies are important are shown in the equation. They're the eigenfrequencies of the basis operators. So at those frequencies, we might be trying to find sets of coherences where the fluctuations are small to get another Trozzi-like effect. So there's always two purposes in doing some mathematics. One is to enable us to do calculations, and this equation will allow us to calculate relaxation rate constants for any coherences. But the other part of doing mathematics is to gain some physical insight. And now what we hope to see from this equation is two kinds of insight. One, the importance of this kind of selection rule that tells us which kinds of terms are effective in causing cross-relaxation or auto-relaxation. And the second insight is the importance of the values of the spectral density function at the eigenfrequencies of the basis operators. So we took a side light, a, a side track. We were transforming back into the laboratory frame and we got stuck. So then I backtracked re-expressed the, the Hamiltonians in terms of basis operators. Those basis operators were easy for me to transform, so I work with the basis operators and then transform back to the lab frame. But why couldn't I have done that here? Why can't I now express the Hamiltonians in terms of the basis operators back in my original approach and work out this term that I'm uncertain about? And the answer is, of course, I can. So I can do the same sort of thing. I introduce the Hamiltonians, get back to this equation, introduce the same decomposition, put in the same constraints, and now I'm back into the lab frame. So I had a workaround. I didn't recognize originally that I had a workaround to my problem, but I did. And now here are my two equations. The top equation is what I ended up with in which in the interaction frame I applied the so-called secular hypothesis before I transformed back to the lab frame and in the lower equation, I had my direct approach. I transformed back to the lab frame as far as I could, then substituted in the basis operators and finished the job. And you can see the two equations are different. In the top equation, I just have the sum over p, and in the bottom equation, I have the sum over p and p prime. So the bottom equation predicts additional relaxation pathways that the top equation doesn't predict. And clearly both equations have to be right. Assuming I didn't make any errors along the way, both equations have to be correct, but it seems quite peculiar that they could both be correct, right? Because they have different summations in them. So the secular hypothesis said the two basis operators can cross-relax only if the eigenfrequencies are identical in this interaction frame. Without applying the secular hypothesis, we predict additional cross-relaxation pathways. For example, we might predict a cross-relaxation pathway between Ix and Sx magnetization. So here's such a case. Let's just do, again, some simulations to see what happens. So now I have two operators, R and S. They have a frequency, an evolution frequency, omega RR and omega SS. They have their own relaxation, rho R and rho S, their own auto-relaxation. 
And now I suppose that they have a cross relaxation pathway. So what happens? We of course could do more mathematics or we could do some simulations. So we'll do some simulations. So here's a simulation in which they have the same frequencies. So this is transverse magnetization for two spins that have the same resonance frequency. I happen to be on resonance and they cross relax with each other. The red magnetization builds up and the blue magnetization doesn't decay exponentially anymore. It's perturbed by cross relaxation. So I have transverse magnetization and I see cross relaxation. Let me introduce some frequency difference between the two spins. Now the red spin processes relative to the blue spin and one observes now that there's build up and then an oscillatory behavior of the magnetization on the red spin. I'll make the frequency difference larger. Now the oscillatory behavior is more pronounced and the maximum amount of magnetization that builds up on the red spin is smaller. Now the superposition of the blue decay and the single exponential decay in black superpose with each other. The evolution of the blue spin looks like a mono exponential. There's no longer any sign that it's cross relaxing. Let's do this one more time. The frequencies are now more different and you can see that there's barely any transfer of magnetization from blue spin to red spin. There's very small rapid oscillations. We would never detect those and the blue spin just decays away exponentially. So in the laboratory frame, cross relaxation is quenched by relative shift precession. When two magnetization components are parallel to each other, there's cross relaxation. Magnetization is flowing between the coherences, but relative shift precession eventually makes them anti-parallel and now magnetization flows in the other direction. And as they process around to become parallel again, magnetization flows back. So the sloshing of magnetization back and forth by relative shift precession ends up with no net transfer if the shift precession difference is large enough. And that's shown in the simulations. And here's just a static picture. When we have the same frequencies, there's buildup of magnetization. But as the frequency differences become larger, then that transfer is quenched. So the secular hypothesis said in the interaction frame, we know if the frequencies are different, when we transform back to the lab frame, this relative shift precession is going to kill cross relaxation. So why bother calculating the cross relaxation rate constant? It's not going to be effective. We'll save ourselves some trouble by making P equal to P prime. If we don't apply the secular hypothesis, back in the lab frame, we have to calculate all these additional cross correlation rate constants but they're going to be quenched by the relative shift precession. So this I think is the other main insight to get from relaxation theory. I said that I wanted you to remember forever was that the adiabatic part of R2 was variance in the longitudinal fluctuations times tau c and now the second important qualitative fact you should remember for all time is that
cross relaxation happens between coherences that have the same evolution frequencies. And if the evolution frequencies are distinct, then cross relaxation is killed. Those terms are non secular and they won't cross relax because the shift precession quenches the cross relaxation. This then leads to this kind of red field kite picture in which one has cross relaxation between longitudinal magnetization, IZ and SZ terms, the nosy effect, but no cross relaxation between, for example, IZ and SZ. We'll talk a little bit later in the course about relaxation interference and that can lead some additional cross relaxation pathways that are indicated here by the dashed lines. So one reason I think that thinking about the secular hypothesis is so important is that I think it's a way of thinking about NMR experiments in ways that are useful. For example, we might want to measure cross relaxation between transverse magnetization, between transverse, say, amide magnetization and transverse alpha, H alpha magnetization. Our theory says that cross relaxation is quenched. But of course, there's an experiment that allows us to do this. That experiment is called a ROSI experiment. And in the ROSI experiment, one uses either a train of spin echoes or a CW spin lock field to remove the shift precession. We lock the two spins together. We don't allow the two spins to process relative to each other. And therefore, we avoid the quenching of cross relaxation. And then we'll observe cross relaxation between transverse operators. So we've taken two operators that are normally non-secular and we've made them secular by locking their phase difference. We also can go the other way. We might be able to take two operators that are secular and make them non-secular. And again, this is the case where spins aren't very smart. It's easy to trick spins into thinking they're rotating by applying 180 degree pulses. So here's an example that's called a quiet nosy in which we can try to use selective inversions to make spins look non-secular to each other. So here's a numerical example. Here we have Z magnetization in which there's an NOE between spins one and two and between spins two and three, but no NOE, no cross relaxation between spins one and three. They're too far apart in our imaginary situation. By a generalization of the Solomon equations to three states, then we can calculate transfer from spin one to the other spins as shown here, and then I've just done some numerical calculation. So I pick some values for the rate constants and just solve numerically the evolution. So spin two is red, spin three is green. There's transfer of magnetization from spin one to spin two, and you see buildup then of magnetization on spin two. And then by spin diffusion, magnetization is transferred from spin two to spin three. So you can see then eventually a buildup of magnetization on spin three, the green spin. One might mistake this then for an NOE between spin one and spin three, and then miscalculate part of a structure. There's no interaction, no direct NOE between spin one and spin three. Now the Z spins all have the same frequency. The frequency is zero. Z magnetization doesn't have an eigenfrequency. If I want to make one of these spins non-secular, I have to make it rotate. And I can make it 
think it's rotating just by applying a series of 180 degree pulses so that the spin is sometimes right side up, sometimes upside down, right side up, upside down. And if you think about a strobe light, it looks like the spin is rotating. And you're just observing it every half rotation. And like I said, spins are easy to trick in this regard. So if I apply 180 degree pulses selectively to one of the spins, I can render that spin non-secular with respect to the others, and cross-relaxation should be killed. So if I do that to spin two, selectively invert spin two, cross-relaxation should disappear between spin one and spin two, and between spin two and spin three. And there's the simulation. Now there's no transfer at all from spin one. Magnetization starts to transfer over, but then the spin is inverted, magnetization starts to transfer back, and as long as I do that quickly enough, then the spins look non-secular. So there are sets of experiments where I think anyway it's useful to think about whether operators are being made to act like they're secular or being made to act like they're non-secular. And many times when we apply pulses or spin locking fields, we might accidentally be making sets of operators or coherences partially secular when they normally wouldn't be. And it could be a good idea then compensate for these effects. So just to finish up, let's just do an example calculation. So we derive the BWR equations. I tried to make that derivation as simple as I could by always referencing back to the random phase model. But actually then once we have the equations and the qualitative insights from them, the derivation isn't so important. But we'd like to be able to do some calculations. So we've done this random field relaxation in our adiabatic random phase model. Let's do it again in now the red field equations. So our Hamiltonian is just delta omega z times iz, the same Hamiltonian that we had before. But now we're going to use it in the BWR equations. So we need the tensor decomposition of this Hamiltonian. We need to know what the operators A are. And we need to identify the spherical harmonics and what Q is. We have to put things into the language of this, of the red field equations, rather than our earlier language. So the operator is IZ. The only operator in the Hamiltonian is IZ. And that means Q is equal to 0. And that means the precession frequency is equal to 0. Our n site jump model doesn't have any angular dependence at all. We're just jumping to different chemical shifts. We didn't say there was any orientation in the problem. So that means that the rank K is equal to 0. And we can just go look up, then, for rank K, what the spherical harmonics are. The spherical harmonic for rank K only has Q equal to 0, and it's equal to 1. There is no angular dependence. And that means that the F function is just delta omega Z. So now I have my decomposition in terms of my new language. It's particularly simple decomposition in this example. When we move on to, say, the dipole Hamiltonian, the decomposition will be more complicated. But that also means we only have one term to calculate. That makes life a little easier. So we want to know about transverse relaxation. So I'll take B sub n equal to B sub m equal to I plus. So we'll get the auto relaxation rate constant for I plus magnetization. So here's what I need. I substitute in. I only have one term in the sum. 
the frequency omega is zero, so I only need J zero in this case. And I have to calculate the double commutator of I plus with IZ and then take its trace with the adjoint of I plus. So I have to calculate some commutators and I can just go look up that the commutator of IZ with I plus is just I plus. I do that again and I end up with then that I have to take the trace of I plus with itself but luckily, as you can see, I can just divide through and get one half J zero. So the relaxation R2 in my red field approach is equal to one half of J zero. And J zero then is the Fourier transform at zero frequency, but that's just the integral. That's the integral of the autocorrelation function from minus infinity to infinity. The autocorrelation function is an even function, so one half of the integral from minus infinity to infinity is just the integral from zero to infinity. And if the autocorrelation function decays as a single exponential, I just do the integral and I get variance times tau c. So I'm back to the same answer. This more complicated theory at least makes sense that it reproduces what I got from my earlier random phase adiabatic approach. And that's a good thing. What would happen if we chose the operator ix? instead of I plus. Well, now I just have to put IX into the equation and do the commutators. So the first commutator returns I times IY. The second commutator returns minus I times IX. I times minus I is plus one. And again, the traces cancel and I get back to one half of J zero, the same answer. We expect R2 to be the same for Ix as I plus because we expect R2 to be the same for Ix and Iy. What happens if I picked the operators to be Iz? What happens if I have longitudinal relaxation? Well, now I plug Iz in. The commutator of Iz with Iz is zero. So it doesn't matter how large the fluctuations are, the longitudinal fluctuations don't relax IZ. And again, we knew that because in our random phase model, the longitudinal fluctuations just affected precession and IZ doesn't precess. So our more complicated theory tells us things that we thought we already knew. We have in hand now through the BWR equations, an approach that lets us calculate any relaxation rate constant or cross relaxation rate constant as long as we're in the fast limit where the resonance lines have collapsed to single exponentials. So what we want to do in the next lecture, given that this equation is rather complicated, is get some practice applying it to situations that we're interested in. And once we get comfortable with the Redfield equation, we'll then go on to ask about how we treat situations where we're no longer in the fast limit, where the Redfield equations won't apply. What tools do we have to address relaxation in those cases? I should have said somewhere along the way and didn't then is how different do the two frequencies need to be in order to stop worrying about cross relaxation. And it turns out in this case life is great. Usually life is bad. But in this case it turns out that once the lines are resolved from each other, cross relaxation is basically quenched. So that's quite useful, you know, quite helpful in practice. Um, Frank Annette, who is now deceased, 
had a large number of papers in small molecules where you can actually measure cross relaxation during free precession without any spin locking because the lines you can measure right lines that are very close together in small molecules but in macromolecules you know the lines are too broad so basically once the lines are resolved in macromolecules there's not going to be cross relaxation if you can generate a coherence that commuted with the spherical tensor that would survive relaxation by that spherical tensor element so one way of doing that is to generate a coherence that's proportional to a spherical tensor so if you had in your fluctuating Hamiltonian some component spatial term proportional to one of the spherical tensors that was very dominant if you could generate a coherence that was proportional to that same spherical tensor the commutator would vanish and that relaxation effect would be zeroed out and you would get a trozy like effect so that's in part part of the game of inventing trozy experiments just imagine you have some three-dimensional object in our particular case it would be the three-dimensional probability distribution for orienting some unit vector and that might be isotropic in which case we just have a spherical probability de um, density it could be that it looks like an American football in which case it has some axial symmetry or maybe it looks like a flying saucer so there's some prolate axial symmetry or it could look like an asteroid where there's no symmetry at all and now you say I want to reproduce this probability density in terms of some shapes whose properties I like and uh, so you know, if you think about uh, an American football and how I'm going to describe an American football um, you might say well let's take a rugby ball instead a rugby ball is just somewhat non-spherical right so you might say I begin by thinking of it is first being composed of a sphere and I subtract that out and now what's left how do I reproduce what's left with some mathematical object the sphere I know how to describe what's left after I subtract the sphere I want to describe as some other mathematical object that's convenient to me and convenient usually means orthogonal to the first one so what's orthogonal to a sphere that I can use to describe what's left over of the rugby ball after I subtract the sphere out of it and it turns out those are the spherical harmonics the spherical harmonics are what you use to describe some angular distribution in terms of functions that start first as the sphere and then progressively um, shapes that when you add them up in the right combination can reproduce the football the asteroid whatever and these you already know um, the rank uh, zero spherical harmonic is just the isotropic sphere that's what you think of as the s orbital in chemistry the rank one are the p orbitals in chemistry the rank two are the d orbitals in chemistry so in chemistry when you want to describe the probability distribution of an electron in an atom you think of it as some combination of s p d f and so on orbitals and those are really just the spherical harmonics so that's the end of the second lecture